Have you ever run away from anything? There were plenty of times at school when I literally ran away from things. But these days, running away tends to take less physical forms. There are things that we should be running away from. And we'll look at those briefly later. God, of course, is not one of them. So when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, why would he run? Have you ever had to go to speak to someone that you don't like, don't trust, and generally are quite sure that they have your worst interests at heart? How would you feel about doing that? Perhaps you would prefer to go in another direction. How about if the person you are going to see was likely to cause you physical harm? How about going in a different direction now? And if you think it is likely that they will try to kill you, what then? At the time of Jonah, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria was Israel's great enemy, its competitor for territory in the region. It was not in the ascendancy at the time, but was still a dangerous place to go especially if you were an Israelite. They had a reputation for cruelty and violence. Here's what the prophet Nahum said. From Nahum 3. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a harlot, alluring the mistress of sorceries, who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. So, to summarise, not a nice place, and remember, they saw Israel as the enemy. There are places like that for us. At the moment, think of Russia and North Korea and any one of the countries on the long list who think that it's OK to be killing Christians. Jonah is a successful prophet. Here's what we know about him from Two Kings. Two Kings is recording the acts of Jeroboam the second. And in, verse, and in chapter 14, verse 25, it says, He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath-Hephar. Gath-Hephar was in the region known as Galilee in Jesus' time. It is highly unlikely that he was the only prophet. So when the word of the Lord came to him, maybe his immediate thought was that there was plenty of other people who God could use. Why does it have to be me? Well, it does have to be Jonah this time, but normally it is not the case that only one person can do it. If God wants something done and one of his servants decides not to serve, God will find someone who will. We should never think that our failures somehow ruin God's almighty plan for the universe. It just isn't like that. There are multiple ways of getting things done, and there are hundreds of servants willing to do things, sometimes even very dangerous things. Now, I'm not intending to paint Jonah as some sort of coward, though that's the way it's beginning to come across. Jonah's reasons for running away are alluded to in the last chapter. So in case you're having a series on Jonah, I'm not going to release any spoilers. But you can, of course, read the book for yourself. It won't take very long. So let's see how the fleeing Jonah got on and how he served the Lord on his journey. Jonah went to the port town of Joppa and looked for a ship that would take him as far from Nineveh as possible. He found a ship headed for Tarshish, which is thought to be the city of Tartessus in southern Spain. 
it was a Phoenician mining colony near Gibraltar. That would take him to the western edge of the known world, exactly the opposite direction of Nineveh in the east. This was likely Jonah's first time at sea. So while he might have been concerned when the storm started, he would only have become scared when he saw how the sailors were acting. He wouldn't see that until the captain woke him because he was in the bottom of the boat, sound asleep. For the sailors, it was a disastrous storm. They were afraid the ship would break up, so each was praying to his own god. Phoenicia was a polytheistic society, so each of them would have chosen a different god to serve. Now they needed the help of each one of their gods. Throwing the cargo overboard was a last resort. It meant that they would not get paid for the journey. It was something they would only do if they really thought that their lives were in imminent danger. They need all the help they can get. None of the gods have been able to calm the storm. So Jonah is woken and told to pray to his god. We are not told whether this disobedient servant did actually pray or not, but the storm did not diminish. Believing that the storm must be happening because someone had upset their god, intentionally or otherwise, the sailors drew lots to find out who it was. And the lot points to Jonah. So immediately there are loads of questions. The sailors need to know who's threatening their ship and their lives. Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What are your people? And now it's time for Jonah to be truthful and to witness to his God. I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. Nothing contentious there for the sailors. There are plenty of gods of the skies and the land, but the next part of the answer frightens them even more. Who made the sea and the land? The sea was thought of as being the leftovers from the primordial chaos when the gods made the land and the sky and all life on earth. But Jonah's god also made the sea, the very thing that was threatening their lives. Now, if God has control of the sea and Jonah is his servant, even if he is a very bad one at the moment, the next question is the most logical thing they could ask. What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? But the answer, throw me in, is more than they can take. And to ensure that they do, God intensifies the storm. Now the sailors must take the action that Jonah suggests. So now they are frightened of his God, because to kill a servant of a God will just bring them more trouble, worse trouble than they're already in. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, they say. This does not mean that they have proclaimed Jonah innocent of his crimes. It simply means that they understood that they don't have the right to make that judgment. So Jonah must be left innocent. So in he goes, and being completely unable to swim in the stormy waters, he will immediately drown. He will not know that the sea calms and the sailors are in awe of his God. Each of those sailors will make sacrifices to Jonah's God. When they finally return to shore as a way of giving thanks for the deliverance but also because the power of this god has scared them and because they've killed one of his prophets so jonah has to be a, so jonah has been a witness to his god despite his disobedience he is then swallowed by a big fish and it's inside the fish for about three days. And that's as far as we go with the story today. So as a servant of God, should you run away? From God, no. But from the world, 
there are times when it's legitimate. And here are a couple of examples. The first from 2 Timothy 2, starting at verse 3. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people, Paul writes to Timothy. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes to the Corinthians, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And the quickest way is often simply to leave the situation where the temptation is happening. But whatever it is, there will always be an exit. I had a conversation with someone at some Christian get-together a long time ago. I don't remember exactly where. And they said that they always do exactly as God tells them. I was sceptical and asked how they could be so sure that God, what God was saying and tried to make up some scenarios to test this assertion. I said I could rarely be that sure that I was directly in the will of God. I left that conversation confused and rather worried that I had missed doing something that I should have been called to. Nevertheless, here I am. We see from Jonah chapter 1 that even if we're running from God, if we're failing to do his will, we can still be a witness and therefore a positive influence for him. It may not be the best option, but it is not the worst. Amen.